Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we are continuing our Cao Cao Let's Talk lore series as we pick things back up for episode 1 of Act 2, titled A Break from Politics. So we ended Act 1 by talking about how Cao Cao's close relationship with Emperor Song's family, in particular her brother, Song Qi, ultimately got him fired as it lost him his first government post, and by the end of 178, an unemployed and frankly bored Cao Cao decided to leave the capital city of Luoyang to head back home to Qiaoxian in order to take a break from politics. Now, unlike how most of us deal with unemployment, we must still remember that Cao Cao was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. So even without a government post or a source of income, he was still wealthy as his father Cao Song was largely unaffected by the fall of the Song clan and remained in the position of Minister of Agriculture as he ended up draining more and more wealth from the treasury into his own coffers. So through the winter month of 178 and into the early days of 179, Cao Cao busied himself with the construction of a new estate back in his hometown as he spent most of his time supervising his house construction, reading, hunting, and most of all, listening to some musical performances by a traveling band that was headlined by a pretty new face in town named Lady Bian. Now, while many of you might be expecting a romantic love story, I do have to remind you that this was not the chance meeting of two single lovebirds, as by 179, Cao Cao, the man who in his youth had tried to steal a bride with Yuan Shao, was already the husband of two wives, or technically one wife, who's the main wife, and a concubine, and the father of three children. Well, Lady Bian, who hailed from a family of musicians, was a poor traveling singer that was still unmarried, even though she was turning 20 that year, which would make her a spinster at the time, given that the average age of marriage for girls was around 13 or 14 years old. So with this backdrop set, let's not focus too much on Lady Bian right now, as we should first talk about Cao Cao's wives and his three lovely children. Well, we do not know the exact year that Cao Cao first got married, I think it's safe to assume that given the norms of the time and the status of Cao Cao's family, he probably got married when he was around 15, or around the year 170, and his soulmate was Lady Ding. Now, if you have a good memory, you might recall earlier in our lore series that Cao Song's wife was also named Lady Ding. And indeed, these two are from the same clan. And before you go off accusing Cao Cao of marrying his cousin, you must also remember that we mentioned Cao Cao is most likely born by a concubine. Thus, his birth mother was not Lady Ding. Therefore, even though on paper Cao Cao and his wife would refer to each other as cousins, they're not actually related by blood. But what we can see from this marriage and Cao Song's marriage is that the Ding clan and the Cao clan of Qiao Xian were quite close, and it's also safe to assume that the Ding clan was also very wealthy, if not powerful, as having a good match between the two households in any marriage was very important for Chinese families. However, much like how Cao Song's Lady Ding was barren, Cao Cao's wife, Lady Ding, was also barren, as she was unable to produce any children for Cao Cao. So Cao Cao eventually took in a concubine by the name of Lady Liu. Now, there is not much recorded about Lady Liu in history, aside from the fact that she gave birth to three of Cao Cao's children, and you might think that would make her very important, but unfortunately for her, she died shortly after giving birth to the third child, and in the end, all three children ended up growing up calling Lady Ding as their mother, as she took care of them as if they were her own. And in case you're wondering, these three children are Cao Ang, who was the oldest son, his younger brother, Cao Shuo, who unfortunately did not survive to adulthood, and lastly, their younger sister, Lady Cao, who would eventually to be called the Princess of Qinghe once Cao Cao becomes the King of Wei. But unfortunately, like most ladies back in history, they did not have their full name recorded. So instead of calling her Lady Cao, let's just call her Princess of Qinghe. 
Now, just because Cao Cao has what seems to be a happy family with his three kids and lovely wife, it does not mean he will no longer take any more concubines, which for someone of his social status was the norm. Even his wife, Lady Ding, would have felt weird if Cao Cao decided to no longer take in more concubines. So when Cao Cao decided to marry Lady Bian in 179, no one was opposed to the idea. And while this type of social structure might feel weird for us today, it was not only norm for ancient China, but it was also well thought out in terms of how the social ladder would work. So you might be thinking Cao Cao, being a rich boy from a very powerful family, could have any girl he wanted. But in reality, social status was incredibly valued. And therefore, because he already had a main wife in Lady Ding, there was no way any other family who was even close to be on par with the Cao clan stature would ever consider having their daughter marry Cao Cao as a concubine. As after all, concubines are ranked lower than wives, and no one from any reputable family would want to see their daughter marry into such a situation. So this meant, if you are someone like Cao Cao who's from a higher social status, and you want to marry more wives and take in more concubines, you will be forced to marry girls from poorer families, or perhaps widows from wealthier families, as widows were looked down upon in society. And this would help those girls reunite with a family of higher stature or maintain their lifestyle as a widow. So in a sense, it evened out the social ladder a bit. And in particular for Cao Cao, who, as we know, has a fondness for other people's married wives, he had a lot of widows as his concubines. Of the over 25 recorded concubines that Cao Cao would eventually take, 10 of them were widows of other people. But in our case here, Cao Cao would end up taking in Lady Bian, who was this traveling singer. And while we could dwell on this love story a bit longer, I think we'll return to Lady Bian a bit later on when she becomes more important in the family. And for the time being, let's move our focus back to Cao Cao, who was only 24 at this time, and he realized he can't just pass his days idling at home. So by 180, two years after the fall of the Song clan, Cao Song once again managed to bribe the right avenues and ended up bringing his son back to the imperial court. This time, instead of working in law enforcement, Cao Cao got an office job at the imperial court as Yi Long, which is a job that acts as a consultant or advisor to imperial court officials. And even though this job isn't technically highly ranked, it was well paid as it paid close to 600 dan a year, which if you need a comparison, Cao Song's official salary at the time was around 2,000 dan a year as one of the nine ministers. Now, we all know that Cao Song made more on the side, but that's the salary portion. And more importantly, the job helped bring Cao Cao closer to the decision-making mechanics of the Han government, as he was now in charge of suggesting ideas for new laws or offering opinions of how to change existing ones. But just as Cao Cao was a little troublemaker at home in his youth, he would once again find ways to make trouble for his father as he threw himself at a very dangerous project at work, as it seems the only thing that Cao Cao wanted to suggest to the court was to consider a pardon for all the scholars involved in the second party incident, and a reversal of the treason charges thrown at General Dou Wu for his part in that incident. Fortunately, these events of the second party incident, which are now over a decade old, means that many of the eunuch who had personally participated in that event are now dead. So that means they're not there to directly oppose Cao Cao's daring suggestions. But the eunuch who remains in power obviously do not want to see the scholars come back, so it's still a very dangerous project for Cao Cao to pursue. And Cao Cao's father, Cao Song, had to once again use his wealth to calm some of these relationships with the Ten eunuch, as he was quite close to them, to prevent any retaliations on Cao Cao. As by now, Cao Song knew that he can't really control or rein in this son of his, so the best thing that he can do is to protect him in order to protect the whole clan, as any retaliation by the eunuchs would result in the end of the Cao clan as a whole. So, 
with the right amount of money, Cao Cao was not punished. But his proposal also never gained any real traction in court, as he would spend the next few years experiencing the corruption within the Han bureaucracy firsthand. And this sort of constant defeat would grind down his will. But fortunately, by 184, the Yellow Turban Rebellion finally kicked off, and the fall of the Han seemed imminent. And Cao Cao was finally able to leave his desk job, as years of stagnating in his consultant role were painful for all to see, including his father, who ended up bribing Zhang Rang, the head of the Ten Eunuchs this time, in order to land Cao Cao a military post as the lieutenant of the cavalry. And shortly after receiving this post, Cao Cao would be able to lead his cavalry to reinforce Huang Fusong and Zhu Jun at the Battle of Yinchuan, where over 10,000 Yellow Turban rebels under the command of Bo Cai were eradicated at the doorsteps of the capital, scoring a grand victory in the early days of the Yellow Turban Rebellion when all seems to be lost. And this victory at the doorstep of the capital would also help elevate Cao Cao to become named as the next chancellor of the Jinan commandery, where he would be once again able to showcase his keen administrative capabilities as he would enforce strict law and order in this time of chaos. And after years of experiencing corruption within the imperial court firsthand, Cao Cao was finally in a position of power to fix some of it even if it's within a regional scope, as he pushed for major anti-corruption effort in all the towns under his jurisdiction, and 8 out of every 10 mayor under his jurisdiction would eventually lose their job under his reign due to corruption charges. And obviously this will result in better livelihood for the people living under his region, and ultimately better tax income as all the money did not end up in corrupt officials' pockets. And this obviously brought Cao Cao's success at court, and it didn't go unnoticed as the imperial court decided to name him as the next administrator of the Dong commandery. And unfortunately, the corrupt rules of the imperial court at this time would come back to haunt him, as by this period, post Yellow Turban Rebellion, title selling has become the norm. And even the emperor was actively selling titles himself to try to recruit some of his personal treasury that he had to spend in putting down the Yellow Turban Rebellion. So he was selling titles himself in the Imperial Palace and he set out rules of how to deal with different title costs and how to sell them. And even if you had a promotion of merit, like the one that Cao Cao was receiving, you were required to pay two years of your future salary up front as an advance in order to receive your position. So of course, Cao Cao had this money to secure this post. But seeing himself as this honorable and untainted scholar, Cao Cao refused to pay the money, and instead decided to resign, as he once again decided to return home to Qiaoxian, where he would go back to spend his days reading, hunting, and listening to music. So with that, we have come full circle, as this episode of our Cao Cao lore series comes to an end. We'll return next time, as chaos continued to engulf the Han Dynasty, even after the end of the Old Turban Rebellion, and as the hero of chaos himself, Cao Cao will soon return once again to the capital, where this time his true journey in becoming a warlord will soon begin. So hopefully you all enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!